Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 47 of this series on fluids and electrolytes. This series is based on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, The Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find it on Amazon. Please follow the link below. It's available as an ebook and hardcover. Both are in full color and also there is a paperback edition. Now we are still on chapter 7, hypophosphatemia and hyperphosphatemia. Today we are going to start our discussion of phosphate homeostasis. So what about phosphate distribution in the body? Uh, approximately 1% of total body weight is phosphate. So if you have a 70 kilogram person, then we have 700 grams of phosphate. Now, most of the organic phosphate in the body is in the bone, 85%. Okay, so the same like with, with calcium, the majority of calcium and phosphate in the body are located in the bones. Now, skeletal phosphate is complexed with calcium as hydroxyapatite. This gives the bone its mechanical strength. Now, 14% uh, of phosphorus is in the uh, soft tissues, and only 1% is in the extracellular space. Now, only 0.5% of the phosphate in the bone is exchanged daily with the extracellular fluid, so not a lot. And in the extracellular fluids, we have two kinds of phosphorus can be organic or inorganic 70 percent is actually organic and it exists as phospholipids now the inorganic portion is 30 percent let's talk about intestinal absorption of phosphate phosphate absorption occurs in the small intestine and this absorption is regulated by calcitriol, the most active form of vitamin D, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3, and also dietary phosphate intake itself. Now, the absorption, like with anything else we've talked about, can be either transcellular or paracellular, when it's paracellular is, as always, passive. Now, transcellular absorption is an active process, and it's mediated by a cotransporter. It's called sodium phosphate cotransporter type 2B or NPT2B or like many people like to call it NAPI2B. Now calcitriol stimulates while nicotinamide inhibits the transcellular or the active phosphate absorption. How do they do that? Well, nicotinamide reduces the number of NPT2B while calcitriol increases the number of NPT2B or NAPI2B. Now, uh, how does phosphate contribute to this regulation? Well, a diet that is low in phosphate is going to increase the intestinal absorption of phosphate because it's going to upregulate, it's going to increase the NPT2B, NAPI2B dependent phosphate absorption. And the reverse is true. So when we recommend a low phosphate diet to a patient with CKD, it's not easy, as you know, for patients to comply. And even when they comply, you need binders, you need dialysis, because actually you are increasing the intestinal absorption. And that's a normal and logical response. If the diet is low in phosphorus, then the intestines are going to absorb more and vice versa. In humans, the paracellular absorption or the passive absorption of phosphate is more important than the transcellular absorption. And now this passive absorption occurs through the tight junctions, meaning between the enterocytes. And these tight junctions are composed of claudines, like we talked about when we discussed calcium and when we discussed magnesium. Now, cations such as aluminum, calcium, and magnesium bind phosphate. This is why they are used as phosphate binders. So they bind phosphate in the intestines. And we use them as phosphate binders in patients with chronic kidney disease. Now, let's look at this diagram. So if we assume a daily intake of phosphate of 1,000 milligrams, like we said, it can vary between 700 and 2,000, so you have to change these numbers accordingly. The small intestine is going to absorb 700 milligrams, but 100 milligrams is going to 
go back into intestinal secretions. So therefore, we have a net absorption of 600, and 400 is going to be excreted in the stools. So the daily uptake, the daily net absorption of phosphate is going to be 600 milligrams. Now, 14% of, of body phosphate is in the soft tissues, while 85% is in the bones. And like we said, only 0.5% of the phosphate in the bone is in constant exchange with the extracellular fluid. Now, in the uh, uh, serum, we only have about 1% of phosphate, so, so this is kind of the same when we, we talked about potassium and magnesium and calcium. Only a small portion of these electrolytes actually is in the serum. The majority is elsewhere. So now this portion will go through the kidney and the kidneys will filter it approximately 4,160 milligrams and then will reabsorb 3,560. This will leave us with a daily urinary excretion of phosphate of 600. So this is again an example of steady state. So you have 1,000 milligrams going in, 400 will be excreted in the stool, and 600 will be excreted through the urine. The net is zero. So this is steady state. How do the kidneys handle phosphate? So we said the kidneys are the main regulators of phosphate homeostasis, and phosphate homeostasis is linked to calcium homeostasis because we have the same hormonal systems. We have three hormonal systems that regulate phosphate homeostasis. We really need to remember those. The parathyroid hormone, or PTH, calcitriol, or 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3, and then fibroblast growth factor 23, or FGF23, with its uh, uh, co-receptor uh, clotho. Now, let's talk about parathyroid hormone, or PTH. PTH is going to decrease renal phosphate absorption, resulting in phosphaturia, while it does the opposite for calcium. So it preserves calcium and is going to waste phosphate. It exerts this action by acting on the proximal tubule, where the majority of phosphate absorption happens. Now, like we said, it has the opposite effect on calcium. So, it's uh, PT is going to cause hypocalciuria and hyperphosphaturia. Hypocalciuria and hyperphosphaturia. Now, the parathyroid hormone is going to stimulate calcitriol synthesis by the kidneys and is also going to stimulate the release of both FGF23 and phosphate by the bones. Now, Hyperphosphatemia, when you have high phosphorus, PTA secretion is going to increase. This is why in dialysis patients with hyperphosphatemia, you have high PTH. Now, this is a normal response. So early on, you have high phosphorus. It's going to stimulate PTH. PTH is going to increase renal phosphate excretion and will contribute to return of phosphate towards normal. Now, a rise in phosphate concentration is going to inhibit the activity of the calcium sensing receptor by a non-competitive antagonism. And I put here uh, an important reference. Now, this paper that I referenced, and I will leave a, a link uh, below, is really very, very interesting. So, the effect of phosphate was demonstrated in isolated human parathyroid cells. And high phosphate results in an increase in PTH secretion. Now, the question is why and how. We, we really, everyone knew that high phosphate increased PTH secretion, but we really never knew the mechanism until this paper came out. So we have a structure of the calcium sensor receptor. The crystal structure of the extracellular domain of this very important receptor revealed four distinct anion binding sites. Phosphate or sulfate can occupy these sites, resulting in inactivation of the calcium sensing receptor. When the calcium sensing receptor is inactivated, we are going to have increase in PTA secretion. So, Actually, when, when I read this paper, I was very excited because finally we know the mechanism. We, so in patients with chronic kidney disease, we have high phosphorus and that results in high PTH. But now we know how because phosphate is going to go to a special, to a specific binding site on the calcium sensing receptor different from the calcium binding site. And it's going to cause inactivation 
of the calcium sensing receptor. When you have inactivation, you are going to have stimulation of PTH release. When you have activation, you are going to suppress PTH release. Okay, so hyperphosphatemia may block the ability of Sinecalce to activate the calcium sensing receptor because Sinecalce works by activating the calcium sensing receptor. But also we know, and we notice that in dialysis patients, when we give them Sinecalcet or Sensipar, if their phosphorus is high, well, it doesn't seem to work too well. So now, again, we know how hyperphosphatemia blocks the ability of the Sinecalcet to activate the calcium sensing receptor, how it's going to inactivate the receptor. And therefore, the PTH will not be suppressed and it's going to go up and that will, will cause resistance of the calciumimetic effect of the Sinecalcet. Therefore, the calcium sensing receptor has binding sites, not just for calcium, but for magnesium and phosphate. Therefore, it's not just a calcium sensor, it's a calcium and phosphate sensor. Now, this elegant diagram is from the paper I referenced, and uh, it shows the phosphate and the calcium binding sites to this complex structure the extracellular domain in both the active state and the inactive state. If uh, you are a nephrologist, a scientist, an endocrinologist, I really encourage you to go and look at that uh, paper. And um, I'm just going to end here and in the le next lecture we are going to continue our discussion of phosphate homeostasis. See you then.